Hi, welcome back to What's Up Doc. Today we are going to discuss dementia, which is a very much feared disease. My name is Dr. Michael Cohen. I'm a family medicine specialist. Recently, a study showed that out of people's concerns of growing old, 76% of them cared about being independent, while only 11% of them cared about staying alive. So the subject at hand today, dementia prevention, is going to look at the modifiable risk factors, um, supplements, and also any non-invasive treatments for dementia. So, first of all, what is dementia? Well, dementia is a general term for the impaired ability to remember, think, or make decisions, and basically a loss of cognitive function, which actually interferes with a person doing their everyday activities. The deterioration in the cognitive function is beyond what might be expected from what's considered the usual consequences of biological, agent, uh, biological aging. Um, to explain, there are different types of dementia. There are many different causes of dementia, but the most common ones are Alzheimer and vascular dementia, and often there's an overlap between the two. Alzheimer's is by far the most common, and uh, it's really characterized by early symptoms of difficulty in remembering recent events, and it's thought to be, you know, it's known to be the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So it's not just a matter of cognition, it's actually considered a cause of death, a major cause of death. So what are the risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's? Well, there are modifiable risk factors and there are also non-modifiable risk factors. And I'll go into what that means. First of all, non-modifiable would be a genetic risk factor. So people are born with different genetics, um, including in particular, there's a particular gene for Alzheimer's called ApoE4. And people who have this gene have a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's than the rest of the general population. Um, there's age, so you can't really do much about your age. Um, and this is also considered the strongest predisposing factor for Alzheimer's. In addition, you've got a family history of dementia. Well, you can't change your family. Um, but then there are other things that actually are modifiable. Um, these include low socioeconomic status uh, or educational status, um, diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, which means uh, people who've got very high cholesterol levels, um, the wrong types of cholesterol in particular, also high blood pressure, um, peripheral vascular disease, which means the disease of the arterial system in general around the body, and cerebrovascular disease, which is the arterial system affecting the brain. Um, it's also known that certain groups have got a high risk of Alzheimer's. These include um, African-American or people of Hispanic descent compared to white individuals. Um, and uh, again, to come to a modifiable risk factor, people who lack physical activity, um, this is also an independent risk factor. So people who do more physical activity have a lower risk of the development of dementia. Another important factor is traumatic brain injuries. Now, traumatic brain injuries are actually becoming more and more recognized as a problem worldwide um, from very young ages in childhood when until recently we just thought, oh, well, a child just knocks their head from this or that. It's actually being recognized how important it is that we try and avoid traumatic brain injuries. Um, people obviously having uh, wearing cycling helmets, people avoiding... Um, head injuries in full contact sports or uh, even in things like football. Um, there's other important factors in the development of Alzheimer's such as um, being, um, being someone who's experiencing secondhand smoke. So if you yourself don't even smoke but you live with someone who does, that in itself increases your risks. Um, and another very important one, but often forgotten generally in, in health, um, is sleep deprivation. People who do not sleep enough or sleep well enough have a higher risk of Alzheimer's if this becomes a chronic issue. So just to summarize, there are modifiable risk factors and there are non-modifiable risk factors. I've gone through a few of each of those. Um, one thing that's very important to say is time, meaning that Alzheimer's develops over many, many years, and the changes in the brain actually happen years before any symptoms develop. So if you really want to prevent Alzheimer's, certainly on a personal level, but also on a population level, we need to be investing 
our efforts well, well, well before the development of any symptoms. And I'm talking one or two decades before in most cases. So even from the age of 20s, from the age of the 20s and the 30s, we need to start thinking about how to make changes in our, in our lifestyles, in our habits, um, in our modifiable risk factors to prevent the development of Alzheimer's years later. So what treatments are available? Well, it, Alzheimer's is notoriously very, very difficult to treat once it's already embedded and grains starting to develop with symptoms. There are certain drugs that have existed for quite a few years. They're called cholinesterase inhibitors, and they may help or reduce um, or control some of the cognitive and the behavioral symptoms. But in general, they don't work very well, and they do come with quite an array of side effects. There are also other treatments in development, but we're not there yet. The important thing to mention is that Alzheimer's probably has some 20 plus different factors that can modify it if we address those factors years in advance and certainly perhaps in the earliest stages of the disease. The problem with the medication only approach is that it tends to affect only one or two targets whereas the strategy that we really need is one which includes multiple targets and probably at least 15 plus different targets. So we're going to talk about that a little bit now as well. Um, if you look at heart disease, for example, we already know, we tell people you need to stop smoking, you need to lower your blood pressure, you need to avoid diabetes or treat diabetes, try and reverse diabetes, um, try and lower cholesterol levels. And this is a well-known strategy that's been used for many years around the world. We need to start thinking of Alzheimer's and dementia in a very similar category. Some people called Alzheimer's um, uh, diabetes type 3, um, uh, vascular dementia uh, uh, and or Alzheimer's are also diseases that can be modified if we address these risk factors at an early stage. One of the risk factors, a very, very important risk factor, not just for Alzheimer's, but for overall mor morbidity and mortality is high blood pressure, otherwise known as hypertension in medical lingo. Uh, a recent study showed that among hypertensive adults, so people who've got high blood pressure, targeting their blood pressure to less than 120, the upper limit, um, as opposed to targeting it to less than 140, was significantly associated with a much smaller increase in the lesions in the uh, white matter of the brain that are associated with Alzheimer's, and also a lesser decrease in the total brain volume. So instead of the brain volume shrinking X amount, it's shrinking less than X amount when we control the blood pressure. Um, the differences were small in terms of volume, but it's likely that over time this does matter. So high blood pressure is a very important one that needs to be dealt with. Um, a study done regarding diet in 2015 in Rush University Medical Center in Chicago investigated the diet in Alzheimer's disease um, in a, what's called a prospective study. So they took 900 plus participants, ages between 58 to 98, and they followed them for 4.5 years. They investigated different diets. They investigated the Mediterranean diet, the what's called the DASH diet, and the MIND diet. The MIND diet recommends very specific brain healthy foods which are included, and also it uh, limits certain unhealthy foods. Um, what they found from this study is that a good adherence to all three different types of diets does reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and even a moderate adherence to what's called the MIND diet may decrease the, Alzheimer's decre the, uh, the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So on the subject of diet, we can see that it is important. Um, this is a modifier risk factor that doctors should be promoting. I also think that the politicians need to step in and start promoting and subsidizing healthier food, um, finding ways for uh, incentivizing um, uh, both manufacturers um, and um, distributors and um, retailers to stock healthier foods and to encourage their purchase in whatever way possible. Um, and um, the other thing to say is that it, while different diets do have different effects, in general, eating more healthily will have the desired effect. To move on to another risk factor, intellectual activities. 
So there was a study done in China um, in elderly health centers in the Department of Health um, under the government of Hong Kong. Um, this was an observational study. Um, so they looked at over 15,000 Chinese individuals who are 65 years or older, and they examined the association of late life participation in intellectual activities and the incidence of dementia. And what did they find? Well, after five years, there was a 29% decrease in the risk for incident dementia um, compared to um, people who did not engage in these particular intellectual activities. Um, and uh, after they excluded those people who developed dementia within three years after the baseline, and after they adjusted for various health behaviors, um, physical, psychiatric illnesses, and socio-demographic factors, um, they were basically able to conclude that you, know, you can both delay and prevent dementia in, in older individuals, even if they undertake intellectual activities such as reading, playing board games, card games in later life. So even people who have perhaps not um, managed to avoid the modifiable risk factors earlier on in life can affect their incidence of uh, the development of dementia even when they start at a later stage in life. So I think this is a very, very important fact. It's something that can be easily implemented. It's cheap. Many people like playing board games. Many people like intellectual challenges. So the point is to actually promote these methods as much as possible. Another extremely important modifiable risk factor is aerobic exercise. Um, it's known that aerobic exercise and cognition are intimately tied together. Um, there was recently a study of 130, 130 cognitively normal individuals who are aged between 20 to 67. And they had, um, uh, they, they were, let's say they were under-exercising compared to the rest of the population. And they'd been randomly assigned to one of two groups that were followed up for six months, four times a week. And the conditions were that they had to do aerobic exercise and stretching and toning. Um, that's how the groups were divided. What they found was that executive function um, of the brain improved significantly in the aerobic exercise condition uh, um, group. Um, and also, amazingly, that the cortical thickness, which means the, um, the thickness of the outer layer of the brain, increased significantly in the same group, the group that did the aerobic exercise, um, in uh, what's known as the left frontal region of the brain. Um, and this was not, um, it was not connected to the age of the patient. Um, so it seems like also the effect of aerobic exercise on executive function was more pronounced as age increased, meaning that, it, that if people do engage in aerobic exercise, it can actually mitigate age-related declines in their cognition. So this is a very useful fact and something that we need to learn from, something that people need to start following. People need to start exercising more. And in particular, they need to start exercising um, with um, aerobic types of exercises. So from everything we've just spoken about, you can see that there are many different factors here. I want to mention just two others which are important and also relatively easy to implement. One of these is vitamin D. A recent study showed that um, having good levels of vitamin D, meaning up to 35 nanograms per milliliter, which is considered um, a normal level of vitamin D, showed people who had such levels had a lower risk of developing dementia. They didn't study above 35, and uh, I, I'm personally looking forward to seeing such a study because it's very possible that reaching higher levels, say around 50, may also have um, benefits, further benefits than just reaching levels of 35. And it's very easy to get one's vitamin D levels up, whether it be through supplementation or just getting out in the sun for a few extra minutes a day. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that I thought was very important uh, is the importance of good relationships. People who have good, close, loving relationships around them, uh, people who are not subjected so much to loneliness, tend to be at a lower risk of developing dementia, full stop. So in conclusion, um, we've spoken today about the importance of preventative medicine in the development of dementia. There are um, many different processes which are concerned with the development of dementia, and 
Um, it's difficult to understand these, um, but research is being done, and it's also difficult to find specific drugs. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get across here is the importance of not just using drugs to target a disease, in particular dementia in this case, but also in having a far more rounded approach, which means to, to treat the basics of human physiological health, meaning good diet, good sleep, good, relationship, good relationships, avoiding smoking, minimizing alcohol, and these other risk factors. So from today's presentation, you can see Alzheimer's is a very complex disease, meaning that it, there are many factors involved in its development. Uh, and that's without us even going into the actual physiology of what's going wrong in the brain. I wanted partly to talk about this topic because it represents so many other illnesses in medicine that we see today. There are many chronic diseases that we spend a lot of time and effort trying to treat, whether it be with medications or otherwise. And I think that we really need to start adopting a slightly different approach, um, maybe even a radically different approach. The problem as I see it today is it probably stemmed, um, I've mentioned this in a previous video, but it probably stemmed from the ideas that came out of treating people with penicillin. If you go back to the early 20th century when penicillin was discovered and it was found that it could treat um, streptococcus um, and uh, rheumatic fever, we understood that there was a certain bacteria and we had a certain antibiotic and we targeted it. And this in a way shaped the way we think about medical problems. So a lot of research is centered on finding a target molecule or a target receptor, something that we can now focus our efforts and say, okay, we're gonna develop a drug that's going to deal with this very specific thing. And the problem is that the human body is far more complex than that. One very clear example of this is the gut microbiome. More and more people are hearing about this and seeing the connections between a, an individual person's gut microbiome and seeing the connection between that and the diseases that that person develops or the health that that person experiences. If we simply target one thing in a person with a certain drug, I think that we're limiting the benefits that we could see compared to whether we start just generally improving the overall health of a person. And how do you improve the general overall health of a person? It comes down to the few basic facts. It comes down to a person eating well, a person sleeping well, a person avoiding certain toxins such as smoke, avoiding um, more than a very minimal amount of alcohol on a regular basis, um, staying physically very active and having good relationships. And I hope that this is the message that you will take from this video today. Once again, thank you very much for joining me today. I look forward to making further videos. I'd be very grateful if you would put some comments down below and I'll be looking forward to responding to them. Thank you.